So tonight our presenter is Stacy Truszynski. Thank you for being here. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background information about Stacy, Stacy is an archaeologist with the Department of Natural Resources in Lansing. Um, after graduate school, she had a career in cultural resource management, stretching from North America or North Dakota to New York, so all over the place, and uh, about 10 years of service in Michigan State Historic Preservation Office. Stacy is now home in the DNR. She helps manage the archaeological data and collections, contributes to land and resource management plans, reviews a variety of state land projects, delivers public history programs and trainings, and consults on museum exhibits. Just to name just a few of the things besides uh, the research and permitting and conducting her own field work for the job as well. Uh, one of her re responsibilities, which she's also going to um, talk about tonight too, is serving as the historian for the Sanilac Petroglyphs um, Historic State Park in Sanilac County. So pretty exciting stuff. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you so much again for participating in our series and feel free to begin. Thank you for having me. And I'm so sorry that I couldn't make it in person. Uh, I am speaking to you from my office at the Michigan History Center in Lansing. So um, I'm so happy to be here uh, with the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project today. So I'm going to be talking to you about public archaeology in Michigan. And when we think about 25 years of public archaeology in Michigan, wow, we, we have some amazing projects that have happened in our state um, um, over the last few decades. And, um, you know, top among them is the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project. But today, I wanted to take you on a bit of a tour of uh, some well-known and some lesser-known public archaeology projects in Michigan over the last couple decades. It is by no means comprehensive, so I hope nobody gets sore if I leave out their project. There are so many more uh, that this could be its own series. Uh, but I wanted to go over um, some of the ones that were top of my mind when I was putting the presentation together. So uh, here we go. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my about my background. And I want to tell you all that I'm so proud that I was in the 1998 Western Michigan University Archaeological Field School. Um, it was awesome. Uh, back then, the uh, the field school was at the uh, Shepherd site and the Ellen White site in Battle Creek. And so uh, uh, it was just a fantastic experience. My professor, of course, was Dr. Michael Nassani, who you all know. And, uh, you know, uh, meeting him, taking that field school transformed my life and just sent me on this career trajectory uh, that, that I'm on now. So uh, I will always be grateful and have so much respect for the legacy of Western's good work and excellent program. So, uh, so I took a field school in archaeology. Um, early on, I sort of figured out that I, I wanted to be a little more um, well-rounded. Um, I think I, I wanted, uh, you know, I love all things uh, material, culture, and history, so I made sure that I also took a historic preservation field school at Eastern Michigan University, and that was in 2000. And little did I know that um, archaeological field school took place at Fayette State uh, Historic State Park on the Garden Peninsula up in Delta County on the North Shore of Lake Michigan. And little did I know that 20 some years later, I would be um, uh, the archaeologist for the site. So, but that, but that was thrilling. I learned how to reglaze windows and fix building sills and do uh, measured architectural drawings to some degree. and and all of that good stuff. So um, that combination of archeology span and uh, larger historic preservation skills really set me up, I think, for moving forward. I uh, ended up getting my bachelor's from Eastern in anthropology, but um, with a historic preservation minor. Eastern at the time, because I am I was a Southeast Michigan girl, didn't have a field school. So I went to Western, scooped up that field school and transferred the credits back. So that's possible. And I did it. I'm glad I did. Um, from there, I went on to my master's at Binghamton University at the State University of New York. And uh, that was a really cool experience because they have the public archaeology facility. And um, I worked for them for, oh gosh, maybe 10 years or so. 
um, while I was a student, but also working on, um, you know, um, you know, my, my, my thesis and all of that, doing field work, they had an extensive contract program. So we did, uh, you know, uh, contract cultural resource management work for all kinds of state and federal projects and um, did a lot of public outreach, uh, you know, uh, uh, programs for young people, adults, um, uh, so they could get field experience, uh, uh, school talks, um, museum exhibits, you name it. But that was a really good experience. And I was very grateful that the grad school I went to had um, that kind of contract arm built in. Uh, after that, uh, I continued with my cultural resource management career, and I've worked yep, from North Dakota to uh, New York, and um, so I've got a little bit of experience in the Plains, but it's really um, Great Lakes region, um, primarily Western Great Lakes. Uh, in that, I also snuck in some museum experience. I worked for a time at Henry Ford Museum in Green Greenfield Village now called the Ford. I was on exhibit staff there and learned how to put together exhibits, learned how to string airplanes from the ceiling and move trains and cars. It was, it was great. Um, it's all working with material cultural and it all fed into my archaeology art. You know, um, everything from how we uh, do research, how we do everything in the field, but how we take it all the way through public programs and exhibits. So um, that was nice too. Uh, I took up with the state of Michigan in January of uh, 2012. I spent my first five years as a split hire between the Department of Natural Resources and the State Historic Preservation Office. The following five years in the SHPO completely. And now I'm back with the DNR. So um, I am loving public service. Everything I do is public archaeology, whether people see it or not, it's for public benefit. And um, um, I'm really proud of that. And I'm going to, in, in, in this tour I'm taking you on today, I'm going to tell you um, uh, about a few of the things we do here at the DNR. So the topics I'm going to cover today are um, real brief public archaeology in the U.S. This is not meant to be, you know, a robust history of uh, how we got to where we are today, but it's just little bits to set the tone for those who may not know. I imagine that the students are well-versed in this, uh, but um, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, the most of what I'm gonna talk about are Michigan case studies, sort of a coffee table book of what uh, we're dealing with as far as public archeology span in Michigan. And then um, I'll sort of close with where Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project sits within that larger public archaeology context in Michigan. And then we can have some discussion. So public archaeology in the US has come a long way. Um, it really began in the 19th century with uh, the first archaeological site for public observation started actually in Arkansas in the 1830s. And then, uh, you know, by 1892, we had a federal preserve to protect the Casa Grande uh, Pueblo ruins. And uh, so things, you know, we, we think of public archaeology as starting in the 50s or 60s, but, you know, the roots of it go back much further. We, of course, had the Antiquities Act in 1906. In 1916, the creation of the National Park Service. Uh, 1935, Historic Sites Act. And in the 1950s, the start of cultural resource management. And that was really important because following World War II with construction booms and the highway boom, people were really uh, in fear of what we were losing, um, not only in terms of you know, neighborhoods and historic buildings, but in terms of archaeology. And so that was sort of a, a, a critical uh, uh, turning point with the origins of CRM. So that 1966, they finally passed the National Historic Preservation Act, which did all kinds of wonderful things, including Section 106 review, which makes um, federal projects subject to a review for their impacts on um, cultural resources, including archaeological resources. So um, with the start of CRM, the Preservation Act, all of this good stuff leading up to it, we were in a much better situation as a country to um, do things about uh, threatened 
heritage sites, archaeological sites, but also um, increase the public's awareness of and um, and connection with the archaeology of our of our country. In 1974, we have the Archaeological and Historic Preservation Act passed, authorizing the oversight and coordination of public archaeology to the Secretary of Interior. Uh, the Secretary of Interior and the Park Service are really uh, central to how uh, public archaeology and all kinds of archaeology are, are happening in the country today. Uh, in 79, we have ARPA, Archaeological Resources Protection Act, uh, which furthers sort of empowers uh, what began with the Antiquities Act of 1906. In 1990, we have the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, so that um, uh, the uh, ancestors and objects of cultural patrimony and the things that are important to tribal nations are uh, returned in a, a legal and respectful way. And that had, a, of course, a profound impact on the way archaeology was done, including the way public archaeology was done um, with uh, it's sort of a, a initiating a greater respect for multivocality for tribal led and community led projects and uh, ethics and projects. And uh, that was that was a big change. So we uh, were making great progress at the national level. And, you know, that protects federal and tribal lands that steers resources, uh, resource protections for federal projects. But, um, you know, what about state and private lands? That's really sort of state by state. Michigan currently does not have a comprehensive cultural resources law, uh, things that protect archaeology. We, we have a little bit. Um, we also don't have an incentives program like tax incentives for resource stewardship. We do have a few laws, um, uh, such as laws that apply to state-owned lands and bottom lands, that um, you know the state retains antiquities rights. You can't loot or take anything without a permit. Uh, but um, other than that, we have private property laws that say you know everything found on a private property is 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 uh, the owner's property. We don't have sort of a state level section 106 or other broad cultural resources law. I wish we did, and and uh, I hope you know, to see one in, in my time, that's for sure. But um, so there's this gap. We've got more robust programming at the federal level, not so much at the state level. And in that kind of context, public archaeology can really play an important role to educate and build support and sometimes help bridge legislative gaps um, uh, between what you must do under law, but what you should do if you are um, you know, interested in the good stewardship of archaeology of your state. So public archaeology um, has a good role in that. By now, um, these graphics from the Society of American Archaeology have been smeared all over social media. They've done a great job of uh, pushing this out. This is a study they did to sort of uh, to take the temperature of how, how people are feeling about public archaeology and archaeology in general in our country. And uh, it's good. Most of it's amazing. Uh, most Americans say that the work we do is important. Yay. And they have confidence that um, what we're telling them uh, is, is, is good information. Uh, they think that archaeology is important to our nation, their community, their heritage, public policy, and the economy. Um, that there should be laws. There ought to be a law. Uh, that it should be a priority for government and that we should increase the land um, uh, th that preserve, the, the lands that preserve archaeological sites. Now, on the graphic on the right, uh, most Americans say that they learn about archaeology at some point in their academic career, and that's true. I was lucky I went to a high school that actually had um, archaeology content available at a high school level and, uh, and fundraised, fundraised to send uh, high schoolers to Crow Canyon Archaeological Research uh, Center in Colorado. So that uh, was, a, was a good thing. Start as young as possible. Uh, kids, the younger they are, they're, they're so engaged with archaeology. It's never too early to start someone on their, on their journey to uh, learning how to be a good steward and how to be interested in archaeology. Most Americans learn about archaeology 
on television. And for those of us who have uh, cable, we know that that can be highly problematic. We have a lot of junk shows out there. Uh, I won't name them, but we know what they are. And they really just do, they do a disservice to archaeological practice in the way that they sensationalize and, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, present archaeology. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't think it helps us in the long run. Um, but people learn about it in museums and classrooms, movies, also dodgy in movies. Uh, and in print media, and also this says 18 online news and social and 15% social media books, blogs. I think it's far more than that. I, I'm, I'm really surprised by that. I think um, online is the way a lot of people get their information, including YouTube, which is blessing and a curse, as we all know. Um, so that's sort of where we are. The good news is people still like archaeology and they still think it matters. And that's something we should never take for granted. Uh, we always have to be doing the good work to make sure that that support stays. So public archaeology continues to foster inclusion, inclusion and multivocality, a sense of place and community. It combats junk content online and on TV. Museums are changing too, with with changes in public archaeology that has had you know ripple effects and the way we talk about archaeology in, in, in every uh, media and venue and museums have certainly uh, uh, followed that as well. The internet, of course, increases opportunities for public presentations and also feedback. Sometimes you don't get the feedback loop. Sometimes when you do public archaeology, you give a lot of information out to the public. You don't get a lot of response, but um, I think online, uh, content is, is a good feedback mechanism, um, but double-edged, it also increases the sharing of irresponsible content. So it's a gamble. But um, for the most part, um, we seem to be in pretty good shape with good support. So here is where I start taking you on um, a tour of some of the best known um, and lesser known public archaeology projects going on in our state. And, um, you know, any presentation like this is just gonna have to start with Mackinac State Historic Parks, just is, and especially Colonial Missional Mackinac. In 1959, many of you are probably aware, I imagine most of you have been to this uh, park and this site, but for those who aren't, in 1959, the Mackinac Island State Park Commission contracted um, in the early days with Michigan State University to carry out a season of excavation at Colonial Michelin Mackinac. And this began an archaeological, a public archaeology project that has continued every summer since. Um, it is billed as one of the longest ongoing projects of its kind. It may be the longest. So this ongoing, beautiful public archaeology project is conducted by Mackinac Island State uh, Park Commission under the direction of Dr. Lynn Evans. And for any of you in the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project who has sat at the archaeology table in the Michigan History Center, you have sat across from Dr. Lynn Evans at the, at the, at the Mackinac uh, State Parks table. She is just an absolutely wonderful human. And you can see her in the bottom left here. Um, I, I, as we go through this, I don't just want to talk about sites and projects, but I want to talk about just the beautiful people who are behind, uh, behind the public archaeology uh, that we benefit from. So in addition to archaeology at Michelin Mackinac, Lynn also runs public archaeology at Fort Mackinac on the island, the Mill Creek Discovery Park, Old Mackinac Point Lighthouse, across Mackinac Island State Park and in downtown Mackinac City. She has so much work, you know, and, and she's out there killing it. She just does a beautiful job. And, you know, I wonder to myself, and I wonder every time I cross the bridge going to the UP and I see, you know, Colonial Michelin Mackinac off to my left, you know, if this project hadn't started in the 50s, what do we think would have happened to the site? You know, uh, we wonder, you know, in, in, in another, you know, universe, it's condos, right, or hotels, or McMansions. So 
you know, thank goodness for the foresight of folks who established this park and, and um, uh, we're very much interested in the archaeology of it. So this fort is a recreation based on uh, you know, archival information maps, but but really archaeology and archaeological evidence. And we have it today largely due uh, to archaeological study. Growing tribal partnerships have had a big impact on the way that archaeology is done and interpreted uh, since the 50s. And a good example of this, if you haven't gone, I encourage you to go on Mackinac Island. Um, one of their museum sites is the Biddle House. This is the home of Agatha and Edward Biddle, merchants who moved in around 1830. Agatha was an Anishinaabek woman. And the new house exhibit talks about her. Um, it was created with tribal partners and it tells the important stories of Agatha, the Biddles, and helps contextualize Anishinaabek experience in Northern Michigan, uh, which is an important thing to do, uh, especially in the Straits and in a, and in a um, uh, significant place to regional Anishinaabek, such as Mackinac Island. So Mackinac Island State Park Commission is a good example of public archaeology that has had a growing self-awareness. When you have a public program that's around that long, you change with the times and you change with um, stakeholder leadership and incorporate their, their views and their ethics and their leadership in your interpretation. So one great takeaway from uh, what they do here is not only their longevity and their success and how much they contribute to local heritage tourism and the economy, but it's their um, self-awareness and their flexibility and how they are always working to do better by the public and by stakeholders. And um, it's, it's um, just this project is one of the standards, um, not only in Michigan, but across the country. And if you haven't met Lynn yet, um, hopefully you can meet her this year at Michigan Archaeology Day. So these are pictures of the fort, uh, largely reconstructed based on archaeology. Wonderful Dr. Lynn Evans, some of the archaeology that they found, um, military things, uh, trade goods, some things that are uh, uh, probably look very familiar to folks on the Fort St. Joseph project. Um, anyway, beautiful, uh, well done public archaeology. For those uh, may be aware and maybe uh, students are aware more than the general public, I guess, outside of the Lansing area, is that Michigan State University has this incredible campus archaeology program. And they work to study and protect the archaeology of Michigan State University's historic campus. And they offer internships, assistance, uh, assistantships, research projects, and field schools. And this program was started by Dr. Lynn Goldstein who felt strongly that the university had a stewardship obligation that was unaddressed. She wanted to raise awareness, engage students and staff, influence the administration about their obligations to uh, heritage and cultural resources and archaeology, train students, and, uh, and study the history of higher education with a specific focus on land-grant schools. So it's really a win-win for everybody. It improves the um, cultural resources, stewardship and health of the campus, trains people, engages the public, um, you know, just checks so many boxes. And they do some wonderful public programs, such as this campus cuisine program. They did 150 years of campus cuisine based on archaeological evidence from campus. Um, uh, you know, so much fun. And then their annual popular apparitions and archaeology haunted campus tour. Uh, the archaeology part is not haunted or paranormal in any way. It's usually done in, ta in tandem with the um, with the local, uh, the campus paranormal society, but it's really so much fun. So in October around Halloween, they do this every year and it's just, um, it's, it's, it's a stitch and you learn so much um about the the growth of that university it's really mind-blowing this is a case where archaeology you can be on that campus um and have no idea about its rich history which of course you know it initially isn't in, is indigenous so um but um so much credit given to the campus archaeology program for all the amazing work that they do and you can find them online they have blogs and facebook and Flickr. 
Twitter, Instagram, Sketchfab, YouTube, all of that. They also share a library of their archaeology reports on their website. So check them out, look them up, read their reports. It's beautiful that they share that way um, with the public. The uh, on to Southeast Michigan, uh, Wayne State University and the Gordon Grosscup Museum of Anthropology and Wayne State's Unearthing Detroit program. This is a project that involves both uh, academic research and public archaeology. It mainly focuses on urban archaeology of Detroit and, and uh, surrounding cities. And it uh, a lot of it is collections based. Wayne State has uh, and the Gross Cup Museum have a beautiful, massive archaeology collection. And so a lot of what they do focuses on looking at existing collections in new ways, which is so important to do. Uh, currently, the team has been doing all kinds of research, looking at the uh, artifacts from the Renaissance Center excavations that happened in 1973 to 74. In Roosevelt Park in Corktown, excavated just in 2012. And that is in the front yard of the new, you know, Ford uh, property that's at the Detroit train station that you know, at one time was iconic uh, for its representation of urban decay, but now has just uh, regenerated. And archaeology at Wayne State, uh, led by Dr. Krista Rosiewski, who's the chair of that program, and um, other partners, including Megan McCullen, who's the director of uh, the Gross Cup Museum, they and their students and their local community partners just do a beautiful job of um, raising awareness of the rich um, immigrant, ethnic, working class communities of Detroit, Hamtramck, um, uh, Southeast urban Michigan. Recently, they did a project in Hamtramck that studied local immigrant and working class heritage. They collaborated with the Hamtramck Historical Museum, which has helped raise support for local history. It increased and, and has helped uh, uh, visitorship for the museum, and it also provided some salvage archaeological services, uh, which were important. So Wayne State has uh, a really uh, fantastic urban archaeology program, and that is important because when you think of excavating a site like Fort St. Joseph, or really any other site, urban archaeology is its own jam, and it, it has some very more complex deep testing methods. Um, it has issues with uh, possible contaminants, you know, uh, it, it, it is, it's tricky and it can be buried deep and, a, and sometimes a little jumbled. So anyone who has the heart and soul to do public archeology span in a city, in an urban environment, in an urban uh, environment has my respect always. The University of Michigan, onto them, they have a recent project that is small but mighty, and you may have heard about this. So um, in Southwest Michigan, Thomas Talbot, who um, is in the photograph in the bottom center, he is a self-taught researcher, a vocational guy, and he first found, um, he found his first Clovis spear point in 2008 while searching plowed fields for artifacts after the rain, which is what a lot of folks, a lot of artifact uh, collectors do. But what he did is he just didn't go home and put things in his pocket. You know, he reached out and he um, oh, felt very seriously about this site, that, that it was very important. So he connected with Henry Wright at University of Michigan, uh, a prominent archaeologist, if you're not aware of Henry Wright, to show him the collection. And um, in the summer of 2020, U of M researchers led by doctoral student Brendan Nash, who's up in the uh, left-hand corner, began to dig the site of uh, Mr. Talbot's discoveries. So this is a great example of an avocational collector who could have just kept things in a shoebox in his house, didn't. He reached out and now the avocational and professional team work together in the field, in the lab. They co-present public talks. Um, I've seen them speak twice. It was fantastic. And this is 
an incredible partnership. So um, it's gotten some press. If you Google it, you're going to find a lot of artic articles. But this is a case where it's just sort of, um, you know, personalities and opportunities really aligned. And um, it's not on the scale of something like a Mackinac State Historic Parks, of course, but this small but mighty project is so important for understanding Michigan history. Uh, a very important and uh, uh, public archaeology project that has been ongoing for several years is between the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, their Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways, and uh, Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant. So these partners work together on the history and archaeology of the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar with federal boarding schools in that era, I'm going to read you a quick paragraph from the tribe's website so I get it right and in their words. The Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School operated from 1893 to 1934 and consisted of 37 buildings on 320 acres of land with an average enrollment of 300 American Indian students per year in grades K through 8. Like other American Indian boarding schools, students were forbidden to speak their language, honor their culture, and practice their spirituality. The students performed work such as laundry, farm work, cleaning, and other manual labor for the majority of the school day. They also received basic academic instruction for the remainder of the day. This represents the US federal government's policy of cultural assimila assimilation and genocide of Native American people. This was the only federal boarding school in Michigan and the principal boarding school for many tribes throughout the Great Lakes. So, um, you know, it, you know, just to underscore the significance of this landscape in terms of not just Michigan history, national history, um, and, and in some ways, international history, um, and of course, um, among, among tribes. So this amazing partnership between uh, the Saginaw Chippewa tribe, their uh, cultural center, the Zeebwing Center, and Dr. Sarah Surface Evans at Central Michigan University, they all partnered to study the property with three main goals. That was to research the history of the boarding school and the children who went there, to educate the public and tribal members about the history, and to revitalize the property as a place of empowerment for the tribe. And so this property was listed in the National Register, Register of Historic Places in 2018. And um, that successful nomination was um, bolstered by the archeology span that was done as well. So uh, public archeology span is also incorporated into their annual uh, on-site honoring, healing and remembering event, public event. And I really encourage you to do two things, to visit the Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways to learn more about the boarding school. But also um, I provided the link um, to the Zeebwing Center's curriculum guide and lessons that were creating about the, created about the boarding school. But I also guide you to Dr. Surface Evans's Prezi presentation online, where you can go, th go, go through and see just a beautiful tour of, of, of the history and the work um, that they've done together. So in the trajectory of public archeology span in, um, in the United States, it sort of started with projects being publicly funded. And then that kind of shifted to public projects being things that are uh, sort of interpreted, right? The public are, are welcome, they are, you know, there's signs, there's programs, there's, you know, interpretation, but then it's, you know, public archaeology is increasingly or frequently moving to archaeology that is done by, with, and for communities, descending communities, and this is a really beautiful, outstanding example of that. Uh, I have to show some love to our Michigan Department of Transportation. Most people don't associate MDOT with uh, incredible public archaeology, but I'm here to tell you a little bit about it. This was a, a, a large project. This M231 project was a federally mandated Section 106 project. So it had some of that. Um, it exists because of law and because uh, public, you know, 
in, in the public good, but it also blossomed into this beautiful public archaeology project, and it's sort of a gift that keeps giving. The archaeology was conducted by MDOT and Commonwealth Heritage Group, a consultant firm, ahead of construction of a new bridge over the Grand River in Ottawa County. Excavations in 2011 and 2012 revealed evidence of several occupations dating uh, approximately, um, you know, AD 1000 to 1500. Artifacts found include pottery, projectile points, bones, and seeds, and um, and, and importantly, this site is 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 well known now for the presence of cash pits that have offered robust evidence of harvesting wild rice and fishing for lake sturgeon. The public archaeology component of this project was um, multi pronged. It includes site tours uh, with tribes, the creation of an elementary education curriculum units. And coming yet even later this year, interpretation, uh, interpretive signage near the bridge. And this project just keeps going. So the lesson plans, one of the things that they created as a result of this project are um, lesson plans for elementary schools. And the lesson plans are called Ancestors, Archaeology, and the Anishinaabek, Bridging the Past into the Future. And this is available on the MDOT website. Um, pretty incredible. So representatives from 10 tribes, five state agencies, two universities, and three private organizations collaborated to develop two short curriculum units, one for third grade and one through for, for fifth grade. And those are the ages where we start teaching Michigan history in elementary schools. So those grades are key. They include lesson plans and support materials for teachers using archaeological, cultural, historical, environmental, and indigenous knowledge. So the public archaeology leads for this project at, at, were MDOT's lead archaeologist, Jim Robertson, and Michael Hombacher from Commonwealth Heritage Group. And they really knocked it out of the park. Um, you know, never underestimate the potential power and, and public archaeology value of what begins as a Section 106 project. So well done, I'm done. If you're ever visiting the Thumb area, beautiful, beautiful, breathtaking Castle Museum of Saginaw County history, I encourage you to go visit them. They have been engaged in ongoing efforts to document, analyze, and record archaeological materials held in the Society's collection and in private collections. And public archaeologist Jeff Summer, who's their staff archaeologist, um, and volunteers to do field surveys to study the rich history of the Saginaw Valley. They have wonderful collections and a fantastic archaeology exhibit in this beautiful building called Revealing Our Buried Past, Archaeology of the Saginaw Valley. Uh, additionally, to what they do with local public archaeology projects and programs, in 1983, they actually started a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So the Historical Society is the only institution in the region officially designated as a repository for archaeological material uh, uh, recovered from the Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge. One of the things that does is help helps keep important archaeological collections local and available for exhibition. So um, if you have uh, the time, the opportunity, visit the Castle Museum, find them online. They uh, do beautiful uh, blogs, a website, and uh, they do a, a gorgeous job. And I will also say, and I might catch some guff for this, I think Jeff Summer takes the best archaeology photos of, of anyone I know. So check out his website for his beautiful artifact photography as well. Also sort of on the east side, on, on our Huron side of the state, is the Oxbow archaeologists. And not a lot of people know about the Oxbow archaeologists. They are affiliated. They are, they are a group of professionally mentored amateur archaeologists affiliated with the Chippewa Nature Center in Midland. And they conduct research on the grounds in the Nature Center from investigating early indigenous campsites to historic settler cabins. They, uh, I believe, I just looked at their website again. I think they're still meeting. I don't think there was a COVID bump. 
Uh, they look for volunteers with their projects. Basically, um, when I first heard about the Oc Oxbow archaeologists, I, who are these folks, you know, in Midland doing all this? And and uh, a good colleague of mine said, I think a lot of them are retired Dow scientists. So um, I think there's been a history of some just fascinating specialties and personalities involved with the Oxbow archaeologists and, and some incredible work that they've done. So find the Oxbow archaeologists online and visit the Chippewa Nature Center in Midland. The Michigan Archaeological Society. Uh, many of you will be familiar, but for those who aren't, the society was officially incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 1954, but it started way before that uh, and traces its origins to 1924, when a group of amateur and professional archaeologists decided that a united effort was necessary to assemble the data at hand and further search for additional evidence of man's early occupancy of Michigan. Um, that's really still their MO today. It is this partnership between a vocational and professional archaeologists, and it is statewide. So they continue this uh, long tradition of a vocational professional ties, and they have chapters in Ann Arbor, Alpena, Detroit, Lansing, Grand Rapids, Monroe, Saginaw, and uh, the most recent chapter uh, was stood up a few years ago in Traverse City. They publish a journal called the Michigan Archaeologist, which is professionally reviewed. It is a beautiful journal. It's an important journal. And um, there are articles in the Michigan Archaeologist back through the issues that, you know, some of that information can't be found anywhere else. So if you see a copy at a used bookstore or online, snatch it up, go online, go to their website, join, buy some. It's just an incredible journal. You can hit any of these chapter meetings statewide. Uh, chapters that meet at universities often have a hands-on component. So if you visit the Detroit chapter, chances are you'll be at the Gross Cup Museum with hands-on with collections or um, the Upper Grand Valley chapter. You could be um, previously at Michigan, Michigan State University, now at Lansing Community College doing something similar. Um, so uh, there's really something for everyone in the Michigan Archaeological Society. They also have an important Facebook group. And for, for, for younger folks, I know, you know, you may giggle when I say important in Facebook together, but it's true. A lot of older folks are collectors. Um, they are comfortable with Facebook as a platform online. So when they find artifacts, they often pop up on the MAS Facebook page. And that's where folks like me and others can uh, find those people and reach out to them and say, hey, this is what you have, help them with identification, or tell them if they have something very important that um, you want to um, help them help them with. Uh, so uh, it's it's an it's an important Facebook page. They do some occasional uh, excavations through the year, uh, including outside of Jackson. A few years back, we did some work at the Leelanau County Poor Farm. Uh, the barn has been renovated into an event venue. They were going to be doing a new, uh, you know, some utilities and a new driveway. So the Michigan Archaeological Society was out there doing work on uh, the poor farm. Poor farm archaeology in and of itself is fascinating archaeology, and we haven't done nearly enough of it uh, that we need to in Michigan. So future public archaeology projects, poor farms. The Warner Pioneer Homestead. This is this project is the is 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 the the love letter to Michigan archaeology by the Bennett family. The Warner House in Livingston County was built in 1855 by pioneers Timothy and Lucretia Warner. Timothy Warner's great 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 grandson Tim Bennett lives in the house now with his wife Carrie and their family, and they are all active members of the Michigan Archaeological Society. And they began investigation of their ancestral farm, Centennial Farm, in July of 2007. The original residence was a log cabin that was destroyed by fire, and in its place, this beautiful Greek Revival frame house was built in 1855. 
The farmstead included a blacksmith shop and other buildings. There is so much to explore. And recently the family moved to one room schoolhouse that was threatened onto the property. So there is just an extraordinary amount of archaeology at this property. The archaeology is done by, for, with the, the descendant family members of the Michigan Archaeological Society in the community. They invite all ages to participate. They have beautiful um, a beautiful online footprint. So look up the Warner Pioneer Homestead and learn more about what they're doing. They are racking up awards, not only for the preservation of the architecture on the, on the farm, but also the exceptional archeology span that they're doing to professional standards. Uh, absolutely incredible. They, they uh, in recent years have won a, an award from the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, as well as a governor's award for historic preservation. So uh, 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 again, one of these just beautiful public archeology span projects, small, but very, very mighty. Uh, a little bit about what we do here at the DNR. We do a lot of public archeology. span We have DNR manages 4.6 million acres of uh, terrestrial land, as well as we help with 38,000 acres of Great Lakes bottom land. It's a ton of stuff. We also see oversee the state's antiquities rights. So all state-owned lands where the state of Michigan owns antiquities rights, we help uh, steward those and we issue associated archeological permits. We do lots of land management reviews for all divisions. So we work with foresters and wildlife biologists and fisheries managers, parks and recreation, uh, I love working with our parks. I, I call it parkeology. It's 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 um, so much fun, and that's where we do most of our exhibit work. But we do um, a lot of programs and statewide. One of the things I'm responsible for is I also serve as the archaeologist and historian for Sanilac Petroglyphs Historic State Park. This is our first state park co-managed with a tribe, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, and we work closely with the leadership at the Zeebling Center which you heard me uh, mention before, um, to co-manage the site. This was a site that was originally purchased by the Michigan Archaeological Society in 1966. They, they, they bought the rock with the petroglyphs. In 1969, they raised enough money, working with Cranbrook Institute and other partners, to uh, purchase the rest of the 240 acres, and then they gifted it to the state of Michigan so that it could be preserved. Over the years, uh, the, the, the state ran the site as a park open to the public. In more recent decades, and this is due to tribal leadership, building relationships, and um, expressing their needs, the, the park is now co-managed. So everything from the, the master plan for the park, where we put trails and benches, to how the site is interpreted, to uh, what kind of visitor behavior is appropriate at the, is appropriate at the site and how the site is documented. All of those decisions are now um, you know, done by, for, with uh, tribal partners in that good um, you know, uh, public archeology span relationship. But this site, I don't want to downplay it um, as you know, simply archeology, span the site is a, a, a significant sacred site to Great Lakes and Anishinaabek. Um, it, it is, it is uh, more, it is so much more uh, than um, uh, uh, archeology span on its own, at least in the public imagination. So we do all kinds of great partnerships together. Uh, one of the things we've done to document the site is that the tribe felt strongly that um, they have an obligation to keep the teachings carved in the stone. Uh, Ezebigatik Asan is the name of the site in Anishinaabe Mawen, which means knowledge written on stone. And they feel it's their obligation to preserve these teachings for seven generations, for future generations. So part of the way they wanted to do that, knowing that this site is carved into soft martial sandstone and might not last forever, is they wanted to digitally record it. So we partnered with the Department of Transportation, we got their half million dollars worth of trust real LIDAR and close range photogrammetry equipment. And every five years, we rescan the rock. So this was just a beautiful partnership between, you know, the, the tribe, the DNR, MDOT, the State Historic Preservation Office, lots of love on this project. And uh, we're very proud of it. I want to tell you a little bit about my buddy, Wayne Lusardi, who's our state maritime archaeologist. 
he works on projects all over the state. As I said, we have 38,000 square miles of bottomlands in Michigan. So not only is he a great terrestrial archaeology uh, archaeologist, he does our wet stuff, our bottomland stuff. So everything from conserving bottomland artifacts, working with conservation officers, because one of the most looted category of artifact is shipwreck artifacts. Um, they often end up online in people's garages and so forth. And our conservation officers are there to bust them. And Wayne helps them do that. Uh, he uh, works on working with the public to record beach wreckage. And the bottom left is a photo of the Joseph F. Spey at 40 Mile Point uh, above Roger City. This is a wreck that sort of a lot of these wrecks sort of uh, uh, disappear when covered with sands or high water, and then they reappear again, or they might shift and move. And so beach wreckage is a dynamic thing. So the public, um, there's lots of public reports about where things are now. Oh, is this new or did we already know about it? And Wayne um, gathers all that information and it kind of susses all that out for us. Wayne works out of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which is also the home of the um, Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center which uh, you can see some of the great exhibits in the bottom right. So underwater archaeology has a great public archaeology presence in Michigan. One of the cool things Wayne's been working on in collaboration with the Tuskegee Museum in Detroit, uh, Diving with a Purpose, uh, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, uh, Wayne continues to work on this in incredible project on the wreckage of a Bell P-39 era cobra in Lake Huron. It was last flown on a 1944 training mission by Tuskegee Airman, 2nd Lieutenant Frank Moody, who you see pictured here. Um, the craft and the debris field are documented and recovered and will be exhibited in Detroit once conservation is complete. The field work has been ongoing for a few years. It resumes for the 2023 season just next week, and we can look forward to some interesting coverage, including a potential um, National Geographic spot. So this is just a beautiful public archaeology project that is 100% geared toward telling the story, the undertold story, of the Tuskegee Airmen in Michigan um, um, and, and the people uh, and the descendants who, who honor their service. Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary, you can take a glass bottom boat, see their exhibits. This is in Alpena. This is where, you know, public archaeology, shipwreck style, you can dive, you can paddleboard over racks, glass bottom boats, uh, sit in on their uh, programs that relate to ocean filmmaking, underwater robotics, and the impacts of climate change on freshwater shipwrecks. They have tremendous public archaeology programming. Um, a lot of the people I've talked to you about today, uh, including many of you, all get together every year at the Michigan History Center in Lansing for Michigan Archaeology Day. And this is a program we all put on together. This has been a program that has for years uh, been collaborated on by the DNR Michigan History Center and the State Historic Preservation Office and all of our wonderful partners. So this year is Saturday, October 7th, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. here in Lansing. And here are some great pictures of your beautiful tables. And I put a special heart around Terry Martin because any project that he is involved with, he is a gift to every project that he's involved with. And you are so fortunate to have him um, working with you on, on your um, Zoark, your funnel. Um, he's very generous with this time and expertise. So hopefully we'll see you all again at Archaeology Day this year. So uh, a few words on why we love in the context of this public archaeology in Michigan, and, and there's so much more I didn't even get to, but why we love and need the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project. You know, congratulations on your 25 years. This um, is a gift that Dr. Nassani, Western and the city of Niles have given to the region through this project. When I was a field school back in, in field school at Western back in 98, it wasn't maybe a year or two after that where, you know, there were rumblings about this project and it was just getting started. And there was so much like electricity in the air thinking about the possibilities of this. And now you're all living it and you're doing it. So, you know, this has just come such a long way. And now we have Erica and your team continuing to rock it and this project has so much staying power because it checks so many 
boxes. So amazing archaeological site, check. Exceptional skills, specialists, and project leadership. Absolutely. And you have Terry Martin. Uh, opportunities for field schools, robust public programs. You have something for everybody in a public program, an incredible large online footprint. It is all ages, it is inclusive, it is welcoming, and it is transparent. The way you roll your style has a lot to teach other pu public archaeology projects um, uh, in Michigan, but across the country. Uh, the project has partners who understand that this rare project beautifully supports local sense of place, honors history, instills community pride, and increases area heritage tourism. It also honors the legacy of Western Michigan archaeology program and field schools. And field schools, um, as we know, uh, for those of us who have taken them, but field schools are critical to training our future stewards and decision makers. Someone's going to have my job one day and we need them to be good. <laughs> so field schools do that. They train our future leaders in archaeology and public archaeology is critical to maintaining public support for them. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't stress enough the importance that we have archaeological field schools happening in Michigan, in Michigan, on Michigan archaeology um, for training the next generation of uh, excellent print, excellent and ethical practitioners. Um, so let's see. With that, um, I think I'm at time. And uh, I just uh, wanting to know if anyone has any questions. And I can also see things a little bit. Uh, wondering what you think, especially as students or leaders of your program, think are some of the challenges that we face or things that we can do better. So thank you. Thank you, Stacey. That was great. That was really good. Um, so I think these are important discussion questions. So I think anyone can really jump into what are some of the challenges face um, public archaeology and what can we do better. Um, I know that we are constantly trying to figure out at the project how we can reach more people with our outreach. Um, so this year we've started a TikTok, um, which I, I know it can be a little controversial, but we are becoming pretty, uh, I would say a hit on there. I think one of our sillier videos had like 300 views or something crazy. So that's nice, but there's always other things that we can do better. And I asked this question actually in our intro to art class when we talk about public archaeology because um, many of the students, and I wouldn't say that I'm that old or that young, but I'm in the middle, but a lot of the younger students, they have better ideas too, and they have different ways that we can uh, in, be um, more inclusive and reach more people as well. And so I always ask, uh, what can we do better? And what challenges um, are out there and see what their thoughts. So does anyone in the audience want to jump in um, and have something to say about this? Um, do they have any ideas what uh, we could do better in terms of public archaeology? Oh, Mary Ellen raised her hand. Go for it. Unless that was an accident, Mary Ellen, I think that you're, you're good to go. I needed to unmute. Oh, okay. Um, not exactly addressing this question, but maybe it's the flip side. Uh, Stacy, I think that you have a kind of a unique grasp on both the public archaeology piece and the local historic preservation piece. Um, I think that we've had some discussion about whether there are benefits to the project, and certainly in terms of preservation um, and protection, there are of creating a local historic district commission around the uh, areas um, that are of this time period um, in that area. Um, are, there, are there any cons or are there a way that it either stimulates or would hamper public archeology span at the site? That is a 
That is a, a really good question. I think that uh, given the state of laws in our state, I think local tools, uh, protective tools are really a, an amazing thing. So local historic districts, if you are part of a uh, certified local government program uh, through the preservation office, you can get not only some financial support, but anyway, you, you, you create local tools for protections that are as intense or as loose as you want them to be. So um, I think, you know, the, the uh, potential is, is, uh, is great. And I think that concerns about what will this mean for what we can and can't do, which is everyone's first concern, will it change my property value? And will it make me do something I don't wanna do? You know, um, there are ways that you can look at your local um, uh, ordinances that can be created to um, allay those fears or at least find a middle ground. Um, you know, the purposes of these ordinances are, are so that people can't do whatever they want, wherever they want, right? There's gotta be some measure of protection, but I think you can find that sweet spot. Um, there's a few cities in uh, Michigan who are have sort of a, a small version of this or heading towards it, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, um, there might be some others. So I think there's other partners you could reach out to to talk with. I would recommend contacting the State Historic Preservation Office for maybe people you can connect with to talk with them about what their communities are, are experiencing and uh, there are any of their hesitations. Um, and you can also contact the Michigan Historic Preservation Network and they will be able to put you in uh, touch with folks. There are statewide historic preservation nonprofit. But those are those are good points. In, in in a state where there are no state level laws, local ordinances are of can be an exceptional tool. Okay. Well, we already are a local certified government that okay. happened a few years ago. So um I think the the local politics or the pros and cons are the something that we want to explore. Absolutely. So, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I do believe through your CLG program that you are eligible to apply for federal funds that can be used toward archaeology. So most CLG money is used for Main Street projects, you know, more traditional brick and mortar economic development. But I do believe that um, archaeological projects also qualify. Check with your shipo. <laughs> okay, thank you. So to kind of go along with that, Stacey, um, we do have a question in the chat. It says, if we connect um, or contact our state legislators about cultural heritage protection law for Michigan, how should we describe it? How should we describe it? I would, uh, I would uh, impart on your representatives what you think is, what you think see as our obligations as as a community as a Michigan family how uh, what's our obligation to be good ancestors right and how can we create some boundaries and how and, and guidance for that in a balanced way Michigan is a very strong private property state I don't see that changing in our lifetimes but there are things that I think um you know um you know, where meeting in the middle could happen. Um, it, it may be just expressing your, your passion for it, that you think it's important as a taxpayer that you, um, like other people did a hundred years ago, they told the federal government, we think this is important, you know, create some laws, you know, kind of pick up that, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, pick up the cause the way that people did you know, on the federal front over a hundred years ago, you know, that, that's something we can absolutely do today. But I think it's about, you know, and I don't mean to be hokey. I really mean this. It's about building relationships, probably meeting in the middle, um, uh, um, not expecting everything overnight, but I think consistency is important. So it's good um, whenever there's a public interest in our state on any front, whether it's fixing roads or Archaeology, or you know, uh, 
forced health, there tends to be a sort of a, a bubble where everybody's interested in something for a couple of years. I think uh, consistent commitment uh, is will go a long way with uh, changing uh, the laws or the, the view of laws we could have in Michigan. I hope that helps. No, I, I can't. I, it was a good I'm, answer. I'm a public employee and I cannot lobby. I can educate, but I cannot lobby. So <laughs> sure. Yeah. And um, that was uh, so and I'm not sure how much you can get into this one, but um, Michael actually asked, uh, how can we partner with state level organizations? So what can we do with them? How can we get more involved as well? Um, so we do a little yeah. bit, but um, first and foremost, I would say that um, in my understanding of the grant landscape, um, you are eligible for more money, the more uh, partners that you have. So partnering with a state entity <clears throat> or another government, governmental entity, and if it's appropriate, a tribal entity, you know, those, um, those groups can often be eligible for different kinds of pots of money. And so when you collaborate on a common vision, you can be eligible for different kinds of money and potentially more money. So I would say that, um, you know, in, in the grant world, um, cross-training, without question. Um, putting forward research designs for conducting public archeology span and field schools on public lands. I think that is something that the DNR is gonna be talking about more in collaboration with universities. That was stuff that was done really decades ago and a lot of it was done decades ago. And then, you know, not much has happened for a while but there's a lot of uh, survey work that needs to be done. Uh, and I think that collaboration is very important. I think, uh, so with, with the DNR, I think a lot of it's training and, and, and uh, you know, in, in field opportunities with people like the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, you know, maybe students or members of the public want to learn more about how to write a very good, a successful National Register of Historic Places nomination. That is hard to do. It is a craft um, but, um, but those opportunities are out there. there there's a need for it. Um, so I think, uh, uh, if you want to empower your local project, get it designated, your site is listed in the national register. That's good. Um, you're in a CLG. That's good. Sort of explore all the programs that the state agencies administer but also look, um, don't be afraid to have some vision and come up with something new. In my experience, there's a grant for everything. If, 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 you, if you keep looking and uh, I think that it's important for not, us not to feel totally boxed in and dogmatic. Well, this is the way it is, so these are our limits. I think we should keep stretching and poking at those boundaries about what we can do together. I'm not trying to be a Pollyanna. I believe that's true. No, go ahead. And, and I, I like it. I always think that we should continue to do more and strive for that. Michael, uh, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, thanks, Stacy. Sorry I joined you a little bit late. Uh, but with regards to this conversation, um, I don't know if you've had any familiarity. I know you've had a chance to... Um, to engage with uh, lots of the archeological landscape in Michigan. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, uh, historical landmarks, national historical landmarks, right? So basically the next step up from the national register. Yes. And my question um, that I was hoping you could help us with is um, are you familiar with other places in Michigan that are recognized as such, and are there yes. potential are there potential benefits for a place like Fort St. Joseph if we had uh, that National Historic Landmark uh, status? Yes, um, there are other National Historic Landmarks in in Michigan. Everything from Colonial Michilimackinac to the GM Tech Center. Um, which is a mid-century modern, beautiful campus. Um, so we're, you know, we, we stretch, you know, a, a broad stretch uh, spectrum with NHLs in Michigan. 
for that, I would contact um, at the SHPO office, Todd Walsh, who is in charge of the uh, National Register. Here's the National Register of Historic Places coordinator from Michigan. And he can talk you uh, talk to you about taking the next step. I am also interested in this. I think there are a few properties on, on state lands that should also be National Historic Landmarks. For example, Fayette Historic Town Site, I think is an extraordinary candidate. But um, I like your style, Dr. Nusaini. I think you are absolutely headed in the right direction. And um, NHLs, having uh, taking the step from being designated on the National Register to being an NHL is extra, extra everything, extra opportunity for money, extra um, protections against certain kind of projects. You are on a river by a dam. There are projects that happen in the area that affect or have the potential effect uh, you know, the Fort St. Joseph site. So I think taking it to the highest level of designation that you are able to is, is the right thing to do. Thank you. Dr. Nusaini, you may have missed my, um, my, my words of appreciation for you at the beginning of my talk. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been, I've been, I've been, I'm meeting this deadline on this, uh, this book on Michigan archaeology and uh, yeah. one, thing led, one thing led to another. And I know you're working hard on that. I can't wait to, I can't wait to buy it. Well, uh, I know every time you come to the site, it's always a pleasure to have you there, Stacy. And I know you're always very supportive. So um, I'm not surprised that uh, you had good things to say about uh, about the project and the work that we've been able to do together. And uh, as I recall, you were a pretty good field school student back in the day. So I was all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Erica. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. If there's not any other lingering questions, I think that we um, are probably exceeding our time. And I've got some field school students that need to get their rest because we're going to have a big day in the field tomorrow and Friday. Um, we're actually having some uh, groups come out tomorrow morning. So speaking of public archaeology, we have the Summer My Way local Y group coming out to see what we're doing. You see, y'all don't quit. It's awesome. <laughs> Keep at it. And hydrate. Yes, extra <laughs> hydration. So, all right. Thank you guys. Um, so I just want to end uh, again. Thanks for the great discussion. So next week we have Andy Beaupre that's going to come. So our um, lecture series is returning to the Niles District Library. We will be back in person, our first one since COVID. So this is pretty exciting. Um, Andy is going to present People of the Post 25 Years of Training Public Archaeologists at Fort St. Joseph. So again, it's going to be in person at the Niles District Library, 6 p.m. Um, the field school students and myself, um, others, we're going to be there. We're hoping to chat with you. Um, very excited about that. So please do not uh, miss this lecture, and we'll see you then. All right. Have a good night.